Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. A- 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 Matthew Dickerson. Tech, 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 tech talk. Tech, 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 tech talk. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Hello, technophiles. It's a beautiful day here in the future, and it's a spectacular thing to share it with you right here today. And what could make this day any better than to share it with the doyen of the digital age, Matthew Dickerson. How are you, Matt? Do you talk about you? James? Gee, what you caught your about? eye? <laughs> <laughs> well, this week I had a couple of opportunities to do some presentations around the future and where we're going. And of course, in that future, electric vehicles came up, solar panels, renewables, wind turbines, a whole range oh, of things. It's an exciting future. Oh, it is actually. I do get excited about it and just seeing some of the things. I mean, one wind turbine, 3,000 homes at mm. now. That just seems incredible to me. But the old question came up, oh no, you get your electric vehicle and of course in just a few weeks time, you'll have to go and <laughs> dump that in some landfill somewhere and all those toxins leak into the ground. Uh, of course. Solar panels again, the same sort of thing. So I wanted to just talk briefly about those couple of things from a general view, a general perspective. So for example, an electric vehicle, when you get that, your battery capacity is at full capacity. So whatever the range is that it's claimed, then you've got that full capacity. What you find, and this is from both reading reports on it and from my personal experience, the range slowly degrades. So one of my cars, 80,000 kilometers on the clock, and it's down to about 94, maybe 95% of its brand new range. So it's certainly degraded over that time. But it's not as if the battery doesn't work. It's not as if my performance has decreased. It's just my overall range. And that will keep going on. That's 80,000 kilometers. That's four years. Mm. So that's degraded a little bit. That might go on maybe 10, 12, 15, 20 years. People don't seem to be so worried about their engines Mm. in an ice car when they buy one of those. and They go, oh, what about what I'm going to have to replace this engine, which wears out sooner than a battery. But the next stage of that, if you're worried about the environment, the next stage is you take that battery from a car and you'll use it in a house. Now, when you're driving a car, you want that battery to be as light as possible. You don't have to cart all that weight around. So when it gets down to maybe, say, 70%, you might say, well, it's time to replace the battery in my car. But you wouldn't throw it out. You'd put it in your house or it'll be recycled yeah, or re- reused. Repurposed. Repurposed. Perfect. Thank you. So once you've got that repurposing project, another 10, 20, 30 years down the track, then eventually, yes, you can recycle batteries. And at the moment, recycling plants can recycle about 97% of the components inside the battery. Now, one person at one of these meetings said, well, I don't see any recycling plants around. I said, that's right, because we don't have a lot of cars around that have been on the road for 10 or 20 years and then been in a house for 10 or 20 years and then need recycling. But I guarantee when there is enough of those materials that need recycling, someone somewhere will say, it's cheaper to take the components of this battery out of the battery and use them again rather Mm. than mine those components as people are doing at the moment. So... I just want to put everyone's mind at ease. It's okay. Buying an electric vehicle is not going to destroy the environment. You might say that it might do the opposite of destroying the environment. And the same with solar panels. I had someone the other day actually I met with who their entire business model is repurposing solar panels after they've been used. Some people might want to have a solar panel that's got more capacity. So they might replace solar panels that are in perfectly good working order, but there are better ones on the market now. Mm. So then those can be repurposed. And again, once those have been repurposed and used 25, 30 years down the track, once again, there is a process to actually recycle the components, the individual components out of a solar panel and then reuse them again. So it's okay, everyone. You can use them and still feel okay about yourself. Progress is likely to happen, you might say. Exactly right. (laughs) And where there is a market opportunity, I guarantee someone will come up with a business model to take advantage of that. At the moment, there's just not enough of those components around in Australia, definitely, Mm. that we have this huge demand for recycling. But when it's there it will able, be able to be done. Yeah, yeah. And we haven't finished, We haven't reached any end point yet, guys. So, no, yeah, watch this space, as we keep saying. <laughs> now, looking down at the menu today, uh, we've got a little bit of retro poking its nose into 2022, I see. The VW Combi gets a modern makeover, and I can't wait to check that out. And, folks, I hope it's got a CD player in the dashboard because guess what? It seems that our old friend, the compact disc, is making an unheralded resurgence back into the music world, believe it or not. But don't worry, because backwards is not the only way forwards today. The aviation industry is finally looking to leave behind the 20th 20th century fossil fuel technology and soar skywards, courtesy of hydrogen fuel. But it'll mean a bit of a makeover for the humble aeroplane as well. 
And speaking of makeovers, ladies, excuse me for my ignorance, but how many shades of lipstick does a person need? Seriously. Of course, I say ladies, knowing full well that lippy is for everybody who's into it. Can we save that argument for another time? But how many shades of lippy do you need? Is matching lipstick to your outfit really a thing? I guess so. Well, here's some cool news from fashion giant Yves Saint Laurent. They're now talking about printable lip- lipstick colour. You just dream it up and then hit print to fix yourself some fancy lip paint. Matt, what? I didn't want to insult you, James, but the blue T-shirt and the lipstick you've got on today, they, right. they just don't quite match. So well, I, I really think you need one of these. I actually thought they did, and that's the only shade of blue that I've got. Oh, and wow. so um, that's what I wore. Oh, and this is why you need one of these Rouge Sur Mesures. Mm. don't know if that's right, but it sounds good. Sounds very French. 4,000 shades of lipstick. I didn't know you would want lipstick I didn't in 4,000 shades. I that many colours. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I don't think I'd actually be able to pick the difference between some of those <laughs> colours there, the, the various shades of blue, as you might talk about. So this is where we're headed. Now... I actually looked at this particular device and thought, it seems a bit expensive. It's about $300. But then I thought, if you've got a number of shades of lipstick, each lipstick device, can you know what are they called? I don't called? know what they are. <laughs> the each, correct name. Each stick of stick. lip. Let's call it a stick. And I apologize to all those people out there who are now shaking their heads going, these two uh, don't know what lipstick's called. It's got a name. <laughs> it's got a proper name. <laughs> so if you have a few of those colors, it wouldn't take long to add up to $300. Yeah. Having a device that can print the exact color. Now, of course, it comes with an app. It's got to have a companion app. Otherwise, it's not real technology. Mm-hmm. So the idea is you put on your outfit. So you put on your blue T-shirt like you've got on. You take a photo of yourself. That's easy. Take a selfie. Then you say to the app, choose a color that will pick. Sorry, choose a color that will match my outfit. And then you get some options for the colour oh, that I match. Really? In fact, it will give you a recommended <laughs> option to say, here's the best colour, but here are some other options as well. Once you decide on which of those colours you want, you click on that, it sends the information to the device, and it uses four different colours that it's got loaded in there to create whatever colour it decides is the right colour for you. Could it, could it choose a tie for me in the morning as well, Pat? Oh, that'd be better, oh. wouldn't it? Much better. <laughs> That's right. Hasn't got that far yet, right, but okay. there's an opportunity for anyone out Wait there for it. choosing a tie. <laughs> Take a photo of the outfit and then choose a tie to match. I like that one, actually. So the idea then, it prints out something about the size of a pea, then basically put that lipstick on, and you have got the perfect colour, so you won't get me insulting people saying that blue doesn't match that blue, yeah, James. <laughs> then you get the perfect colour to match the outfit. Now, you might also decide that I actually just have a favourite colour, even though I'm wearing an outfit that may not match. I've just got this colour that I really love. So I take a photo of that colour and it will perfectly match that colour to the lipstick that you want to put right. on. So you can have your favourite colour and just produce it whenever you need it, rather than having your lipstick devices there all ready to go and just put that lipstick on. does it pretty quickly. It doesn't seem to have a huge ongoing cost. I mean, the $300 to buy it, but the actual the, the little, materials for the Yeah, printing. the cartridges, each cartridge you put in, they don't seem to be that expensive and they don't seem to use them up that quickly. So the ongoing cost of your lipstick isn't that much. Just choose your colour per mm. day. This is where we're headed, James. All my lipstick worries are over. That's right. Solving the big problems of the world we are here. Now to a story on the war in the Ukraine. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about Google Maps pulling the pin on their live traffic app to protect users from giving away their location to the Russian army. Well, now they're sending air raid alerts straight to residents' Android phones. Matt, some very creative support mechanisms coming out of Google Google in a time of great need. And we do talk about this, James, and saying it's not nice to talk about what's happening in the Ukraine, but it is happening. And I do like technology solutions that might help people. So we did talk about the live alerts, as you talked about. Yeah, and I just think it's it's amazing how um, yeah, various big businesses have come to the party. Um, yeah. You know, if governments try to step in, then there's the risk of escalating something to much larger. But um, Google can do some subtle things like that yeah. and really help a situation. And my experience or knowledge of air raid alerts is when I flick on the History Channel and mm. see something from London when yeah, bombs were being back dropped in, the blitz. in. Yeah, back in the Blitz and in Second World War. But this is actually quite fascinating. We've got earthquake alerts on a Google phone. That's one of the systems they've built in over time, try and help people if there's a tsunami coming, for example, or just an earthquake in general. So that system has then been adapted by Google to give you air raid alerts on your phone, which has got to be much better because you might be in your house, you might be away from the air raid sirens, and hold on, you've got to install air raid sirens. So there's a bit of work there. So suddenly if your country's under attack, like in the Ukraine, 
then did they have those air raid systems in place already? The, the sirens in place, so they're just going quickly install some. Where do they have them? Can you hear them everywhere? Whereas with this concept, Google gets the information from the from the Ukraine government, and then once they've got that, they just send out an alert to anyone that's got an Android phone. Now, of course, not everyone's got an Android phone, but there would be enough people, you would think, in any given environment that mm. people would say, hold on, I just got this alert on my phone. I don't think we should be here. Let's go to wherever you go when there's an air raid siren that goes off, whether it's some yeah, bomb right. shelters, whether it's something you might have built in your house, whatever it might be, you can take that action. But getting that information direct to your phone, it's a little bit like bushfire warnings that we see here in Australia. It sounds like a very sensible move for a very desperate situation. Well, it's remarkable. But um, here in Australia, I mean, thankfully, we don't have much call for air raids, um, air raid alerts, I should say, or earthquake alerts or volcano <laughs> alerts. So, like, tsunamis, we got tsunami alerts uh, uh, last summer. So, um, yeah, look, I, I just think uh, it's amazing that Google can step in and do something constructive and um, and help save some lives, hopefully. And the, the really good thing about this type of thing is that you should be able to use the system, and I haven't got enough information on this particular system, but it should be set up such that it doesn't matter where your home base is, it doesn't matter where your registered or normal use of your phone is, it would go out from a tower to say, People near this tower, mm. there's a air raid happening, so we can send it to everyone with a Google phone within proximity of this tower. Mm. It's similar to the way the bushfire system works. It doesn't matter where your normal place of location is or your registered SIM location is. It just says, everyone in this tower that's connected, here's an alert that goes straight to you. It just makes so much sense. So yeah. you can really target very specific locations, and then obviously Google could even go further and geolocate people if they needed to. But I... I suggest it would just be based around a tower location because they know that if you're near that, it's probably not a good place to be right at the moment. Bingo. Matt, this next story has question marks all over it. If you've ever wanted to contribute to cancer research but don't have the time for a PhD in cell biology, then how about this? You can actually help research into cancer by downloading a puzzle game called Genigma. Matt, how does this work? <laughs> Sounds cool, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And I assume <laughs> they've taken the name Genigma maybe based on Enigma from Yeah, cracking the code. Yeah, 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 code cracking. So it's a phone puzzle game. And I haven't downloaded it yet. I, I do need to do it because I do enjoy puzzles and I do enjoy trying to solve puzzles. But with this one... I'd actually be helping cancer research. We're contributing which, something much bigger. It sounds crazy. How could that possibly happen? Now, there's some researchers in Spain, and they're trying to map a whole range of DNA inside cancer cell lines. And that DNA changes ever so slightly. Now, DNA is fairly complicated. A cell in your body's got about two metres of DNA. So mm. you roll that out. I don't know how you roll it out, but if you roll that out, there's about two metres of DNA. And the mapping of that, what they're looking for is the changes in those cancer cells, but they're trying to solve some puzzles with it in terms of how it might look once it's changed from a cancerous infection. They can do that with supercomputers, but that costs time and money because you've got to get access to a supercomputer, you've got to write a program that goes and tries to look at all those different ones, and there's a fair bit of work there. So the researcher said, maybe rather than a supercomputer, we could use the supercomputing power of the crowd. All those mm. people out there that have got all their combined intelligence and they can solve some of these puzzles. So essentially they created an app, they put it out there. At the moment, 30,000 people across 130 countries are actively playing Genigma. And already they've been able to map some of these various DNA possibilities from a cancerous infection. So that, the researchers are getting information back already. That's crazy. It is, isn't it? it so, And I, I don't quite understand enough about DNA to know exactly how they would use that information to then try and help solve the problem of cancer. But I just like the concept that I could be playing a game and you can play against friends and you can try and solve puzzles against each other and try and win against someone that's remote, some friend or family you might have elsewhere. So you're, you're doing that competitive concept, you're solving puzzles, all these things are exciting. But somewhere along the line, you go, wow, I might have just helped a bit of cancer research. And it's all, all the while, it's accumulating data on what you're moving you know, and how you're moving in that game. Accumulating data on how you're solving the arrangement of puzzles is the way. And again, I should have played it before we did this yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah. I was actually but, thinking the same thing. <laughs> but again, you're trying to come up with different arrangements that will still allow that DNA structure to be valid, but obviously some way or shape 
different to what it should be. And then they're saying, well, here is a possibility, here is another possibility, here is another possibility mm. of cancerous infections rather than normal DNA structure. Yeah, so right. it does sound fascinating, but again, I'm going to leave all that part to the researchers. I like the Should idea I that I can play, play a game. Yeah, <laughs> Here's another problem-solving game. You might learn something while you're at it. Well, it, it might contribute to worldwide research. I just like the idea that I can be part of the whole concept of worldwide research more so than a supercomputer. So I go to the next level and I go, so now I'm a supercomputer? Is that how I understand this? <laughs> <laughs> works for me. It works for me too. <laughs> Here's the next domestic must-have. It's all for a breath of fresh air. They're indoor air quality monitors, and they'll detect indoor pollutants from about 100 paces, I understand. Perhaps for families with a high proportion of particularly flatulent adolescents, Matt? (laughs) It's fascinating. We've talked before about the fact that personal health devices, watches, for example, that's the real explosion area. And it is. And if someone said to me, where are we going to be in five years' time with technology? That's the one area that I think will explode. But I think we're also going to see some explosion of other health products. And in this case, this is a home health product. Mm. And it is interesting because as we move less and increase our weight, we want to see more just how unhealthy we are. And that's what a lot of these devices <laughs> are telling right. us. They're saying, you're yeah. very unhealthy. And I'll keep reporting how unhealthy enough, you are. You? <laughs> that's right. In fact, the World Health Organization said that worldwide obesity has tripled since 1975. So ah. we know that from things that we see and news articles we see, but there's a pretty harsh stat. So mm. we are unhealthier than we were in terms of our obesity levels, but we're really good at tracking just how obese we are yeah, now. Well Maybe that's God. part of it. But these sort of monitors, just air quality monitors, you might think, well, what are they monitoring for? Is it a bit of pollution in my home? That's probably not that likely. I don't smell pollution or smoke in my home. But there's a whole range of things that these monitors can detect. And it used to be a big, expensive, complicated machine, probably a machine that goes ping, as Monty Python would say, <laughs> that detects some of this information. But now you've got these small devices that can detect a whole range of things. So what are we looking for? Well, the first thing we're looking for is particulate matter. Now, particulate matter, and we're talking particularly about items that are 2.5 microns or less. So mm. fairly small particulate matter. And what, again, going back to the World Health Organization, they consider particulate matter 2.5 and less to be the largest environmental health risk we face at the moment. Now, not yeah, the largest right. environmental risk, but the largest environmental health risk. So you're looking for things. Now, they're created by vehicle exhaust, that type of thing, uh-huh. power plant emissions. And you inhale these and they just sit in the bottom of your lungs. And I just think that's the lungs. idea. Yeah. They, they just get stuck inside your lungs. They're too small for you to breathe out. They do just get stuck in there. Mm. And so they essentially are a, a major health risk. Build up a tar. Sorry. Uh, so, but, but, sorry. So power plants, vehicle exhaust. But one of the things that's interesting there is that when you cook with gas inside your home or you have a fireplace inside your home, they can produce particulate matter of this 2.5 micron or less as well. Mm. And and I know when we built the house that we're sitting in now, James, it was about 22 years ago. And I remember talking to the builders and they were talking about the gas lines that would run into the house. And I went, no, no, I don't want gas. You've got to have gas, natural gas. We've got it all through the streets here so we can just plug it straight in. I said, I just don't like the idea of gas being in my home, burning it. I had no idea about particulate matter 2.5 at the time, Mm. but I just didn't like the idea that you're burning stuff inside your home. Surely that can't be good. I'd rather electricity, thanks very much. So I eventually convinced them that I didn't want gas in my house, so we've got no gas in here. Now I look at this and I go, gee, was I clever 22 years ago or what? (laughs) (laughs) But so that's one of the first things that these devices can detect. They can detect this tiny particulate matter. Now, what are you going to do about it if you find it? Well, if you were cooking with gas or you had fireplaces in your home, you might decide to cut back on those. If it was made up of vehicle exhaust or power plants, for example, you might have some way of closing off the outside doors and maybe filtering air that came in. But being aware of it is the first step Mm. to saying, well, what can I do about it? So that's the first thing. Carbon dioxide levels, these will detect as well. Oh, wow. And you think, well, what's that coming from? Well, that's coming from us, Us, typically. So if you had your house really well sealed up in winter to keep your heating bill down and you want to keep that nice warm air in and keep the cold air outside. You keep feeling sleepy. <laughs> that's right. You get to that point where you may well get to that Realise that you've got too much carbon dioxide in your room. Yeah. And, yeah, wow. And so they will detect that. Now, we talk about, again, I don't want to get onto climate change at this early stage in the, in the podcast, but about 418 parts per million we're sitting at across the world, which we know has increased dramatically. But it's not that difficult to get up to a 1,000 parts per million inside our house just from breathing the air and having a a well-sealed house. So that's quite interesting. So basically, this is an easy one. You've 
got that little monitor you've got sitting there somewhere in the corner and it starts telling you you've got to, a, say, for example, a thousand parts per million. Well, just go and open the door for a bit. Let some fresh air in. Mm. And so what mum told us when we were kids, get outside in the fresh air. Yeah. Well, you yeah, know, maybe she knew what she was talking about. Maybe she had a, some sort of internal carbon dioxide monitor. So that's one that it'll, it'll pick as well. Well, there's got to be something here for renovators as well because, you know, renovations are is a common thing now. Yeah. Um, and, and surely we know we can see when the dust is blowing around in the air, but when the dust seems to have settled – you still might have little bits of stuff floating around there yeah, that you yeah. might be inhaling that could be quite dangerous. Exactly um, right. I'm, I'm concerned about older houses with um, potentially asbestos um, that's well, been disturbed. That's one thing I didn't find in all of these monitors. There was no, no, right. no testing for asbestos in there or there was no device that gave reliable results. And okay. maybe because there are so many people out there doing some significant scientific testing for asbestos, maybe they don't feel, the manufacturers of these don't feel they're good enough to live up to that sort of standard. Yeah, but, right. Okay. Um, carbon monoxide, they'll check that. So carbon monoxide is odourless, colourless, and it's deadly. So you don't yeah. need to get very high levels. So it's obviously a bit different to carbon dioxide. But even low levels can cause confusion. They can cause memory loss. So you really needed some large device in the past to detect that. But now you can detect that quite easily. And cooking, internal cooking can be an easy way to generate some carbon monoxide mm. in your house as well. And probably the last one is volatile organic compounds. Yeah, the good right. old VOCs. I know you're worried about those. I can see the look on your face right well, now. Well, they're often stinky, um, so you can often smell them. Things mm. like you know, with an acetone base or um, you know some sort of alcohol base too. Yeah, that's right. Things like I suppose hairspray would have it in yeah. there. Cosmetics, disinfectants, uh, cleaning fluids, all those things. Yeah, but again, yeah, yeah, and you might smell those a little bit in your house. You're quite right. You might, oh, well, there's a bit of a smell there. But how much is it? Is it too much? Mm. I just use that bit of cosmetic you know, lipstick, if we go back to the <laughs> first story. But is that too bad? Well, these will give you an exact level. And you're probably more worried about long-term exposure there. And most people with these would smell it and they'd open some doors and they'd a bit of fresh air in, obviously. But you probably might have some sort of better idea if you've got something that's giving you a reading for these. You probably will smell them, but maybe there's a low enough level or maybe you've got something that's exposing you to some of these VOCs and it's a level that you get to the point where you just go, well, I'm used to that smell now, but they can do damage. They can actually do damage to livers, to kidneys. So oh, that, yeah. that can be pretty bad. Uh, respiratory irritation. So again, you've got air quality monitors that will detect that sort of thing. So all of these different devices, they can give you warnings on your phone. They can send information to an app. They can give you visual or audio, audible warnings in the actual house. You can actually even get them to the stage where they're tied into the rest of your house, for example, your air conditioning system. You might have air conditioning turn on or bring fresh air from the outside. So there's a whole range of things. But just being aware of it, I think, is the first step. Uh, we needed this 25 years ago. Uh, I used to work in, with a lady who was a lab assistant and she had no sense of smell. Uh, that, <laughs> to, in terms of occupational health and safety, that wouldn't cut the mustard in 2022. Really, no. <laughs> but perhaps with a, an air quality monitor, maybe we would have got away with it. Yeah, it might have been okay. right. You might have had some warnings go off somewhere and said, well, I can't smell anything, but that thing the over there is coming on. That's right, telling me that I'm about to die. Oh, goodness me. Here's a story for the but what about people of the world. With governments advancing very tenuously towards a future that doesn't rely on fossil fuels, it's up to businesses to build momentum in the direction of sustainability. And the but what abouts are set to lose yet another one of their go-tos, that being the aviation industry, who have been an enormous consumer of fossil fuels since the dawn of commercial flight. Hydrogen-powered flight is set to become a leaner, greener option now, but it's likely to mean a complete design overhaul, Matt. What's happening with Airbus? So I do feel guilty when I fly sometimes, but I do tick the box when but I buy my tickets to you're say... You're on a plane with a group of other people. I am. So you're on mass transport rather than a private jet. So I shouldn't feel so good? It's too uh, bad about myself? Yeah, you can, you can, you know, you can rationalise. I'm one of the 0.01% of people who do tick the box to say, please give me some carbon either. offset. So, yeah. <laughs> But obviously, we've got a world that's changing and we've got to have some way of solving some of these problems. Obviously, aviation is one of those particular issues. Now, Airbus are doing some experimentation. They've taken the original A380. So this has got serial number one. Wow. Ah. Personally, I can't believe they produce a plane with serial number one. <laughs> Normally, when you start a new business, for example, first invoice is number 1,001 or yeah. 100,001. You don't want anyone to know that you're the very first customer. And I actually do look. It's a bit of a habit I have when I get onto planes. Usually in the door, you can actually see the serial number stamped inside the door. Right. So you just get a bit of a habit there and look at the serial numbers. I've never been on A3 number one, and I don't think any 
paying customers have because I think it was used for certification of the A380 airframe. But you do have a look at those serial numbers and you just, I don't know whether I want to see the early numbers or the late <laughs> numbers, but it's just a little thing you do as you get on. So Airbus has taken the very first A380. They've actually fitted a hydrogen engine to the back in front of the tail. So you've got your normal four jet engines on the plane, on the wings, and then this extra hydrogen engine. Now what they want to do is they want to have normal flight, but they want to run this hydrogen engine just to experiment with some things. So Mm. it's pretty easy on the ground to say, let's get this engine running and produce enough thrust and make sure we can actually fly with this. But then when you're at 36,000 feet, it's a bit colder up there. There's not as much air up there. So how does it behave? How does it perform in all of that? And we talk about hydrogen. Everyone says, oh, just burn, in inverted commas, hydrogen, and you just get water out the back of it or water vapor. Well, you do actually produce a few nitrous oxides as well. And yeah, in- that's just because the nitrogen's already in the air. Yeah. And any hot, hot engine is going to produce nitrous oxides. And so how about when you're at 36,000 feet, does it produce more nitrous oxides or ah. fewer? You might think logically. I, I logically would say fewer because there's less nitrogen at 36,000 feet. But... Maybe not. So this is part of the whole process with Airbus. And they're actually doing it away from the other engine so that they can actually have a plane following and do some testing with what's coming out the back of it. Presumably at some stage they're going to be at a high enough point where they can say, let's cut the jet engines, let's just run the hydrogen engine and then see exactly what this plane behind us might be detecting. So the whole range of design changes they'll make as they go forward. One of the things is that in the old days, I'm talking about the old days is still what's happening now, <laughs> You had all your jet fuel in the wings, of course. Most planes have jet fuel in their wings, and then sometimes you might have a bit more in the body of the aircraft. But the way you've got to store hydrogen is in some form of compressed manner where you've got to have tanks that can handle uh, very high pressures of those compressed fuels. Mm. So in the wings is not the appropriate place to put it. So they've got to find somewhere else to put it. Obviously, there's space in other parts of the aircraft, but you might want that space for cargo Cargo. or people maybe. I don't imagine you want to put people inside the wings of the plane, for example. (laughs) So you've got to fit all this in. So the whole concept here is they're trying to come up with ways to change the design of a plane to still have what you'd call normal flying characteristics, but fitting around the hydrogen fuel. You also need more hydrogen fuel. It's not as energy dense as jet fuel. Fair few things for them to consider in this whole process. The ultimate aim from Airbus is to have zero emissions aircraft in service by 2035. Oh, now, wow. That's I've, I've watched Discovery Channel, and I know that it takes a long time to design an aircraft. So I imagine that if they're going to get aircraft in service by 2035, they can't start designing it in 2034. Mm. They're going to have to start designing it a long way in advance, and they're talking about maybe by the year 2026, they'll have made some of the big decisions, maybe not the final design of the aircraft, but big decisions around... How many engines? Where will they mount those engines? Mm. Where will they store the fuel? Some of those big design components and then start to get down to the more refined level of design. The ultimate aim for the whole aircraft industry is 2050 to be net zero. So you get to the stage where you're zero emissions aircraft by 2035 and then net zero for the whole industry by 2050. That's fairly ambitious. We are talking about 30 years away, but things have got to start changing now to get there. Mm. I wonder if... um the overall net weight of these planes are going to, is going to be much, much less as well because they're using hydrogen too. You'd expect so because it's much lighter fuel than, than the normal octanes. But uh, and you mentioned that we can't store the fuel in the wings, but I thought, well, why can't you have a high-pressure tank in the wing? I think it's the actual shape of the tank seems to be the issue. Ah, so okay. the tank is a certain it has to thickness. Be round, and it has to be probably cylindrical rather than... Correct. Yeah. Okay. So you try and stick that cylinder in with enough capacity to store the hydrogen you need, and then it starts to make the wing too high. I'm talking without any basis of fact here. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just imagining Very that... Very amateur engineering, but that's, that's right. all right. I'm We've imagining start somewhere. That, that that's the, the part of the problem they have. Now, they may come up with a design that's got lots of small tanks, so they could fit it in the wings, mm. and these are the sort of problems I think they'll solve as they go forward. Interesting enough, in some of the articles I've read about this particular concept, there seems to be the general view that we'll still see electric aircraft used for short haul. So mm. we talk about four, five 500, 600 kilometres maybe for those electric aircraft. We'll still see electric aircraft for air taxis. It seems to be a more convenient way to go to have EVs and cars. I still think for short haul vehicles, so I'm talking about trucks maybe that are doing short distances and light fleet, light uh, vehicles, I still think you'll see electric rather than hydrogen. But I think where you'll see hydrogen on the ground will be 
trucks that are going across the Nullarbor, trucks mm. that are doing large distances and need a short amount of time to refuel before they do their next large distance. And that's where we'll be with aircraft as well. You want to fly Sydney to LA, you need an aircraft that can start in the air for 13 hours or thereabouts, yeah. and it needs to be able to be refueled pretty quickly to then go again, plus the weight of the batteries trying to take that. Now, interesting point you say about hydrogen. When I was a kid, I used to race BMX bikes, and I used to have this concept of what about... Inflating the tyres. Doing everything, putting hydrogen in the frame, <laughs> inflating the tyres with hydrogen. And I actually went through the thought process, and then I thought, well, what I'm actually doing when I'm racing a BMX bike is a, it's not so much the weight of the bike, it's the mass of the bike. Mm. And you imagine if you put enough air in the tyres, enough air in the frame, or sorry, hydrogen in the frame and the tyres, that it, you picked it up and you go, wow, that's so light. But when you're racing, you're moving all that mass through the air. So I decided in the end that it wasn't going to help me because even though it might have made it lighter to actually lift up, it wasn't going to make less mass for me to move through the air. Mm. But it's interesting what you talk about with aircraft because what you are doing is you're trying to create enough lift to get that aircraft up in the air. Mm. If you've already reduced some of the lift required because you've got lots of hydrogen in there, that might be interesting. Maybe... yeah, the, the need for as much fuel. Yeah. You know, it's now, all about getting the, the air speed up, though. Maybe uh, when you compress the hydrogen, though, you're actually not getting that same effect. Hydrogen's obviously lighter than air, so that's where you're getting a hydrogen balloon that will lift up in air. But maybe once you compress it and put it in tanks, mm. maybe you're not getting much of an effect of that actual lessening of the weight. Mm. Well, for, we'll have to talk about that a little bit more because uh, we could talk about compressing your yeah, octane fuels as well Yeah, because uh, they've got to be compressed too a little I'm, bit. I'm intrigued now. I'm going to go oh. and research that one more. I like it, James. I like it. <laughs> now, if you talk to surfers, they'll tell you that surfing is a lifestyle more than a sport. Life happens in between wave sets and when the surf's up, well, then school's out. But the problem with living on the coast is that sometimes, well, the swell's just not up. And then what are you going to do? Well, that's where inland surfing comes up trumps every time, dude. (laughs) And I'm talking waves, man, artificial waves, man. Now, (laughs) they all come without fail. Am I right, Matt? You are so hip down and groovy. (laughs) (laughs) You know the lingo. (laughs) I couldn't have done that any more grandfatherly. Right, okay. So it sounds like a great concept, and I've had a go on some artificial surfing devices that just kind of create a little wave there for you when you get on there, and Mm. that seems pretty simple, but you just sit still in the one spot and the water goes underneath you. But what you've got now, and this is an Australian firm that's preparing to debut the biggest surf lake in the world. Still at the R&D stage, so we can't go and surf on it yet and hang 10 Mm. (laughs) and use your lingo. (laughs) This is a facility that's 20 kilometres inland from the surf, so you don't have to Mm. go and be on the ocean edge. Anywhere. Anywhere, that's right. It's a 3.6 hectare man-made pool. And right in the centre of that pool is a 1,400 tonne compressed air steel pump. And it goes up and down every six seconds. So basically it's Mm. creating a wave. Now, the way they've designed this 3.6 hectare pool or lake is that you've got different surfaces on the ground. So even though you've got this perfect wave that comes out, this cylindrical wave that comes out from it, because you've got different surfaces on the ground, it creates different types of waves. Yeah, right. Now, obviously, first of all, they're talking about maybe recreational, maybe just someone saying, hey, let's go and surf inland, what a cool concept. But they're also talking about the fact that you can get the stage where you could have competition surf and you're not relying on the weather. You're not mm. relying on how are the sets coming in today. Gee, we're down with the lingo, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> how How is the surf today? Can we get a good competition? You can have consistent waves and effectively you could create those waves however you wanted them to by how yeah. often you bring this cylindrical pump up and down. It's just about the frequency of the oscillations there for the physicists out there, but um yeah, you can get the, the size with the resonance. You can get uh, various sizes yeah, and Yeah, you could too. Yeah, I hadn't thought about the resonance of it. But again, by creating that lake with different ground structures, by creating the, the pump in the middle going up and down at different rates and different capacities of that, you could effectively create something that was consistent but also different, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But you knew you could have a surfing competition. So this one, for example, they basically pumped them out about 2,000 an hour. So imagine that, going to the yeah. beach, being guaranteed to get 2,000 waves an hour to surf on. You could have people all the way around this particular lake. You could have 
amateur and, and lower level waves right. and then higher ones and build up larger waves. So a whole you can range have of your things. Surf school teaching the grommets how to start off. That's right. And then once you've See, progressed from here, more lingo there. Yeah, yeah, right. good work. <laughs> <laughs> and then move around to some of the harder waves and move around to the bigger waves. I just think this sounds fantastic. And mm. I'm a little bit biased because we do live inland, so mm. we don't live on the coast. And surfing is one of those skills that I cannot tick off. I've had a bit of a go at surfing in the real world and on some fake ones, and I just I haven't got it quite nailed yet. So, so, so being a Dubbo local, you know what question is going to come next. When can we do what, it here? What's at Sandy Beach, right? <laughs> what's, what's the plans for Sandy Beach? Sandy Beach, yeah, this would be great at Sandy Beach, although I don't know that Sandy Beach is quite 3.6 hectares yeah, in size. Quite have <laughs> but, the, um, but we've got Burundong Dam, so yeah. why not create a little part of Burundong Dam as a surf pool? I just think this sounds fantastic. And then surfing, as you say, it is a lifestyle choice sometimes, things you do in between catching waves. But it does seem like a pretty skilled sport. So the idea of getting out there, paddling out, jumping up, Mm -hmm. balance, doing some fairly fancy things on a surfboard, it sounds like something that I do wish I had a few more surf skills. But (laughs) this might be the way for me to get it. Now, if that last story didn't strike you as very much straight out of left field, how's this for the list of things that you didn't expect today? CDs are making a comeback, folks. The market is back on again after a 17-year hiatus. Matt, the world is upside down. It is upside down, and I'm okay with this. I get a bit concerned when I hear that vinyl's coming back, because vinyl to me... No, I love the sound of vinyl. It just scratches. No, the crackle is part of it, (laughs) but the bass that you'll hear on a Led Zeppelin record off vinyl, you just, uh, yeah. And there's people that tell me that, and I listen to it, and I just... All I can hear is the inconsistencies, the crackles, the, <laughs> the bits that don't sound like they should be there. And then I listen to CD and I go, that's pure, that's beautiful. That's some ones yeah. and zeros on that particular yeah. CD have turned into sound. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. Zeppelin will sound good on anything, but that sounds really good on vinyl. Well, yeah. anyway, I'm happy to know that to CD sales went up last year for the first time in 17 years. Up. Oh, well, they hang on. Up. Did they go up from next to nothing? Because, <laughs> you know, any increase on nothing is an increase. Isn't well, it's it? a good is point it? you make. So it's not a huge industry. In the US, for example, $584 million worth of CDs were sold last year. Mm. And that was a 21% increase wow. on the year before. So I'd say that's the first time they've gone up year on year in 17 years. See, look, I can appreciate also, like, you know, 60s and 70s hippies and, and, and you know, rock enthusiasts just loving vinyl. But I'm just wondering what's, what's special about CDs other than it gives you that perfect sound. There you go. You've, you've nailed it for me. So, uh, yeah, look, streaming so, services are obviously going through the roof, but I think the idea that people like about CDs is that they can still buy their CD and own it because you yeah, don't really yeah. own your music when you go and stream it. You can just keep using that service. Yeah, who looks at a, a Spotify collection? Nobody. No, that's right. They but could your look CD, at your CD collection there on the shelf and go, wow, that's an impressive that's right. And then you collection. can pull out one you haven't listened to for a while and listen to that. So I get that, although I must admit, when I'm driving along in the car sometimes and I'll say, oh, I just thought of this really good song, kids, and you can actually just tell your car or yep. tell your streaming service to play that song mm. and you don't have to go and find that CD or find that record. So I love that about streaming services. But having that CD collection and maybe your kids go and browse through it and what's this old one here, Dad? Yeah, let's play that and <laughs> watch the kids run a mile while you try and play some great music from your era for them. <laughs> but again, just the fact they're going up. Now, vinyl, when we talk about $584 million for CDs, vinyl sales were over a billion dollars last year. So they're still bigger than CDs, which is interesting, but CDs, an increase. Now, that might have been a one-off. It might have been COVID-related. It might have been lots of people sitting at home getting nostalgic. Who knows? It'll be interesting to see what happens this year to see whether CD sales continue that increase or, as I suspect, it was probably just a little blip on the radar and they'll be back down to lower because I don't hear, as you say, many people have that passion for CD like they do with the vinyl. Yeah. <laughs> and let's face it, it's probably not going to fit in the dashboard of uh, any car anymore. <laughs> no, Where are you not at all. It? <laughs> it used to be, remember when you had the stacker in the boot, you yeah. bought a car and you loaded up the boot with six or ten CDs in the boot and then it got fancy where you had stackers in the dash. Yeah. So you could just feed these, and who knows where they want, but they just went in the dash somewhere <laughs> until one gets stuck. And I had one of my cars once that one got stuck, and to get it out, it was the whole dash apart. You pull you this to pull thing apart out. the engine. Oh, just about. <laughs> <laughs> it was like that, and then finally you found this CD there. But it was such a breakthrough to have 
a CD or multiple CDs compared yeah. to the old tape. You have to pull the tape out and turn it over, that sort of thing. So things have changed compared to now. We just stream away. That's right. But explain to kids now that you had to load oh, CDs in the about. boot. Imagine that. Right, we're going to play a new song. We'll just stop the car, pull over, open the boot. <laughs> what, are they, what are you doing, old man? <laughs> Apple has streamlined trading further for you and you no longer need one of those little chip readers, those little white squares that um, you've got to scan. For for FPOST transactions, all you need is their latest release, the iOS 15.4. Matt, the list of things that a phone can't do shrinks yet again. (laughs) It does, doesn't it? And there's a few things about iOS 15.4 I'll talk about, but the one that grabbed my attention was for all those people out there that have got shares in Square, Square readers, Mm. get out of them now. Because in the past... They're going the way of CDs. (laughs) Exactly right. They'll come back for a day in another 17 (laughs) 17 years' years. time. I go to the market sometimes and I walk along and I find something I want to buy and then I say, can I buy that? And they go, oh, oh, I've got to get this damn Square reader hooked Mm. up and... They're relatively easy, but half the time I end up doing it for them and get it going for them to be able to take my money. So this is the idea. You'll be able to go forward now if you've got – it doesn't need to be the latest iPhone. It only needs to be a phone in the last three or four years. If it can handle 15.4, more than likely it's going to be able to be used as an FPOS machine. I just Mm. got to make sure I don't put a T on the end of that, as many people do. It's not FPOS. It's FPOS machine. So that's one of the the new features in that. Now, you still have to have an account with some company that does – online transactions, but then it will just be hold your phone out, someone taps a card or taps their phone or taps their watch on your phone, and that's it. Now, I haven't looked at the fees for these. Apple is notorious for liking to charge high fees, higher fees Mm. than other merchants, because they can, I suppose, and the convenience factor there. But that's obviously a big part of Apple's whole process going forward, their whole profitability going forward will be around some of these fees. But just to give you a few other features in the latest version, and you can get it now, you can download 15.4 now. In the past, if you had a face mask on, now we've gotten fast face masks, so they've now come up with a solution now that we don't need them anymore. (laughs) But in the past, one way you could actually unlock your phone with a face mask was with a watch, but it meant you had to buy an Apple watch, which was okay for Apple, but maybe not okay for everyone else. So now you'll be able to unlock your phone with a face mask and Basically, it's still got some way of identifying you, so you don't have anyone put a face mask on and unlock your phone. Uh, and so they've got that, and it works quite well. I've actually played with that feature a little bit, so that's quite good. Uh, we talked about FPOS. It's also got a new safety feature for air tags. So we did talk about, or we have talked about that a couple of times, where yeah. maybe an air tag could be used as a stalking device. So some new safety features built in there. And the most important thing, James, if you didn't like previously the four voices you had for Siri, the option for one of those four voices, mm-hmm. A fifth voice has been added for Siri, a fifth American voice, and this person has confirmed to be someone who belongs to a member of the LGBTQ plus community. There you go. So if you're worried about the voice being too gender specific, now you've got something that's, well, maybe not gender non-specific, but at least from the LGBTQ plus community. So that's something that Apple has done to be a little bit more politically correct. Do you know, I had a great idea there. I think there's a big market for having a big range of voices and caricature voices. (laughs) That'd be good. (laughs) (laughs) Possibly a bit not not so PC, but uh, it'd be hilarious. Can you imagine John Cleese talking to you the way that he might have talked to his wife in Forty Towers and uh, (laughs) and just uh, giving her some abuse in that way that, might be in a voice that abuses we, you. <laughs> we always, when we got the uh, the voices on the Google Maps and we're, we're getting directions and we decide to take our own special detour, um, we're always worried about, and I, I guess everyone does, worries that they're going to upset the person <laughs> That's right. beyond the Google Maps. <laughs> Where are you going, Where James? Are you going? <laughs> I said left at the last turn. Since their emission scandal seven years ago, Volkswagen designers and marketeers have been working in overdrive to make up for lost ground. So what does a brand that is linked to the free-flowing lifestyles of the 60s and 70s, what do they do in 2022? Well, you take a combi and you make it electric. Matt, has the hippie lifestyle just had a 21st century zhuzhing? Well, go back a step. Was it seven years ago, Dieselgate? 
Seven years. Seven, yeah, wow. yeah. 2015. Wow, yeah. that time's just flown by, hasn't well, apparently, it? Well, it was, it was between 2008 and 2015. The, the, and they're finally exposed in 2015, yeah, yeah, I presume. 2015. And I do get, I said Dieselgate, and I get annoyed with myself <laughs> for doing that because I hate how any scandal just, just gets gate. the term just gate, on gate on the end of it. And it makes no sense because it was all about <laughs> Watergate. The Watergate was the Watergate Hotel. <laughs> That's right. So why do we put gate on the but end of it? People know what you're talking about when you throw gate on That's the right. end of it. That's right. So all I, that matters. If I say James Gate, yes, does that then destroy your reputation? That's right. <laughs> yep. So I love the old combi. My brother had a yeah. combi. One of my brother's friends had a combi. And I just used to love the concept. They are their own subculture. They are. And you talk about surfing from a previous story. Yep. It just felt like you had to be. You either had a Sandman or you had a combi. That's right. And or you didn't surf. <laughs> or you didn't surf or you weren't cool. That yeah. was it. <laughs> and, and my brother actually rolled his combi down uh, hill, so road and Cutler Park for anyone that's local that might know that one. They were probably yeah. young and silly when around the, the corner. At the risk of the slander, yeah, they weren't the safest <laughs> vehicle on the road, <laughs> no. were they? Well, they got out of that okay. They rolled it all the way down the hill. I reckon it would have been like being in a little can of sardines, maybe yeah. just bouncing around. You get to the bottom. Luckily, they could still open the doors and everyone just got out and went, wow, that was not the greatest thing to do. Not a whole lot of airbags in those either. I don't think so, no. So anyway, V-Dub, as you say, are really focusing on electric, which is great because they have got – a bit of ground to make up from their diesel scandal, not mm. diesel gate, their diesel scandal from seven years ago. And they, I think they're doing a pretty good job with the whole electrification. But if you want someone that's into flower power, someone that's a hippie, someone that's caring about the environment, then what better thing to do than yeah. to have an electric combi? And they're not calling it a combi anymore. They're calling no. it a microbus. I'm a yeah. bit disappointed in that. Yeah. I, I want the combi name. <laughs> but what they have done is remember the old – yellowy, browny sort of colour that yeah. most of them seem to be, then this is one of the colours. You've got 11 colours to oh, choose really? from, but that's one of the colours. You can go and back I, to the old colour scheme. I can see that being the most popular of all the ones. I reckon there's going to be a couple of Scooby-Doo wagons, mystery <laughs> mystery buses, um, <laughs> yes, yes, that would be great. around too. <laughs> now, one of the other things that was a, an urban myth around combis was if you had a combi, supposedly in the actual manual, when you pulled out the manual from the glove box once in a blue moon, you pulled out the manual, supposedly at the front of that manual, it had a little bit that said, when you see other combi drivers, just give them a little wave, just a little finger oh, up yeah. off the steering wheel, yeah, yeah. not too over the top, pretty cool, just one lift of the finger, and that was it. And this was this You're myth going club. around. And I actually was writing a story years ago, and I wanted to know whether that was true or not. So I found a, an archive site that had all these old combi manuals. So I went through and looked at the first three or four pages of each one of those. No Found mention. Nothing. Nothing oh, at, no. Nothing at all. I love the idea, though, but, that it yeah. said wave to other combi drivers. <laughs> if, even if it is just a myth and people were doing the wave, yep. there's the club right there. Well, it did. And, and again, my brother used to say that he had to wave to other combi drivers and they always put up their finger and that was all cool. But again, I didn't worry about looking at the the manuals back then, but now I've looked at it, <laughs> destroys that myth for me, but I still love the idea that people should be waving to each other. Back to the car, back to, <laughs> back to this particular microbus. About a 480-kilometre range on a full charge, so it's a good amount of range. It's got a, a little 170-kilowatt um, motor in there, so that's pretty good. Fast charging, get to 5 to 80% in about 30 minutes. So oh, that's it's great. Yeah, and again, I think they're getting it pretty right in terms of what you can do with these. Now, again, the first model of these is all about moving people. They want to create that whole combi culture. But once you've got that shape, take the seats out, or they will make models without seats, and it's a great cargo device oh, yeah, as well. Yeah. In And this is the European version. In America, they're making... <coughs> In America, they're making a longer wheelbase version, and again, that'll mainly be used for cargo when people talk about getting the deliveries, and what a perfect vehicle to do deliveries in, because most delivery drivers, they load up in the morning, they go and do their deliveries, they're not travelling very far, mm. but it's stop-start, stop-start, mm. which is terrible for an internal combustion engine, but fantastic, but fantastic for, for an electric yeah. motor. So that's all of that. And they're not doing a lot of kilometres in a day. Most of those delivery vans are running around a town or a city, they might only rack up 50 kilometres, maybe 100 kilometres, but it's a lot of that stop-start, on-the-go, stop-start, all of those things. So 480k range would actually smash those deliveries and it would make it so much cheaper for these people to run around. So keep an eye out for this. It's going to debut next year. It won't be on sale, unfortunately, to 2024. Oh, right. Go if, wait that long. Yeah, if we see the current sort of process that we're seeing in Australia – if it's on sale in the US in 2024, should be here by 2034 maybe. That seems to be about <laughs> the lag we're getting for over here. But no, it is, it's quite exciting. But again, it's just one of those things. So many more options, so many more 
different configurations are coming out in electric vehicles that we know excuse all the excuses people are throwing around at the moment mm. that we know excuses left i'm sorry mm. and particularly if it comes with a surfboard rack as well <laughs> what more do you want <laughs> so when you're ordering it day glow lemon yellow is the color you're after <laughs> day glow lemon yellow <laughs> Keep that in mind, folks. And with that, I can hear the faint muttering sounds of a mob gathering outside the window. As I peer through the shutters, I see the flickering torches and a glint of light against the cold steel of a well-sharpened pitchfork. Matt, it seems that the Luddites are onto us. You paint a very interesting picture there, James. (laughs) (laughs) And I guess we'd better better beat a a pretty hasty path uh, to safety. Thanks for another super week of Tech Talk, Matt. Thank you, James. I'm just picturing Shrek outside the window, that scene of Shrek where they're chasing down. The pitchforks are coming. They're coming for us, James. We've got to get out of here. I'm James Eddy, and I'm going to speak quickly. Uh, It's been an absolute pleasure once again, folks. We look forward to catching you again next week for another episode of Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Don't forget to like and subscribe.